Hey everyone, my name is Kirsten Cook. I really wish I could be here today, but uh, the timing was bad during the middle of the week to be at the FFF Festival, so I made a little recording that hopefully gives you a better idea of what my workshop's all about and what this fall quarter holds. I am staff with Adventure Programs, as I have been for about four years now. I'm a recent graduate in the Environmental Studies and Spanish programs. I am Leave No Trace certified and a naturalist, and I know a lot about ethnobotany, uh, backpacking, and much more. I've now taught five workshops for the Nature Awareness and Eco Adventures Education Series. I've also taught two online Leave No Trace classes, and I write for a backpacking blog, and I am a project leader for the Isla Vista Ethnobotany Project. I would like to start off by acknowledging that we are fortunate to be able to work and play in the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of the Chumash people. Much of the knowledge that I share during these workshops comes from traditional ecological knowledge preserved and passed down through thousands of years by these peoples and many others throughout the country and world. I hope that this presentation can do justice to that tradition of sharing knowledge about how to live off and protect the land while also acknowledging that the original inhabitants of this land have been irrevocably harmed by those who arrived on their territory with no thought but to claim it for themselves. You all are probably wondering, what on earth is this workshop all about? Nature, education, and eco-adventure series? Hmm. Well, basically, the idea is that I want to help educate other students, other staff, other people in our community about the local environment and you know things that both affect humans and maybe don't affect, affect humans things that they can go out and do in the environment how to enjoy the world safely how to recreate in a way that doesn't harm nature or animals or plants um, I, I mean I love being a teacher I love showing people like oh you can eat this plant and then hearing a couple weeks a month a year later oh i tried that plant you told me about um and i really i really hope that this workshop and these these future workshops this quarter can create excitement and energy amongst different people um, about the outdoors especially during covid where there's not all that much to do and you know a lot of people that maybe typically aren't going outside pre-covid a lot of them are going or they're moving outside and maybe they're more used to cities or they've never been camping before and they don't really know what's going on and so i kind of want to be there to help them on their journey to give you all a little taste of what i've been teaching workshops on i started out with some nature journaling exercises and i also was teaching how to identify plants um, and different methods that I use to do so based on more scientific versions or kind of ways to identify plants that are easier like using the internet. I also taught a lesson on natural hazards that can be found in the Santa Barbara area which focused on animals, plants, and abiotic hazards that could potentially be harmful to humans in Santa Barbara. I've also taught workshops on all seven principles of Leave No Trace, plus some additional ones uh, that we kind of made up for online programming. They were pretty cool, so how to respect wildlife, dispose of waste, um, how to deal with bears in bear country. I also had the pleasure of teaching a class on Santa Barbara invasive species. Um, basically, we went over how they spread, where they're from, what they are, animals, plants, insects, how they harm, how you can prevent them from spreading, um, and much more. So yeah, I mean that's pretty much what I've done so far and I'm hoping that this fall quarter I can get a bunch of new and exciting workshops going. Um, each day, so we meet once a week on Fridays, you can come to any of them or none of them, um, although you know I'd love to see your faces every day. Um, and each Friday at noon, I will have a new workshop set up. Usually it will be in a PowerPoint form 
uh, but I am trying to include like activities and things that the audience can do so they're not just sitting there with their camera off. Um, usually that involves annotating or typing something in chat or sharing a story with your volume on. And um, I, for some of them I've also got little activities. I kind of want to make it fun and not super boring, just oh this lady's got another PowerPoint. Um, but also, there's only so much you can do on only so much you can do on Zoom. The current lineup for workshops for this fall quarter are as follows. On Friday, October 9th at 12 p.m., my first workshop for fall will be about rare and endangered species of the Santa Barbara area. This workshop is intended to increase awareness of rare and endangered animal species that can be found locally. We will also discuss how they became endangered, how to reduce impact, and more. The second workshop for fall is on Friday, October 16th. It will be about Chumash ethnobotany. The purpose of this workshop is to increase awareness of how the native Chumash people interacted with and used plants in the Santa Barbara area. On Friday, October 23rd, the workshop will be called Outdoor Recreation in Bear Country. The purpose of this workshop is to help people be more aware of bears and how to interact with them in a way that does not end up harming themselves or the bears. We will discuss Leave No Trace in Bear Country, personal safety and risk management, and more. On Friday, October 30th at 12 p.m. also, I will be teaching a workshop called Pee, Poo, and Periods in the Outdoors. The purpose of this workshop is to learn more about how to stay healthy and care for oneself in the outdoors, as well as how to help others out. This workshop is for anyone of any sex or gender, because even if you don't have a vagina, you might know someone who does. On Friday, November 6th at 12 p.m., I will be teaching a lesson in homeopathy. Why should you make your own teas? The purpose of this workshop is to make people more aware of the herbs around them and how they can be used for personal health, refreshment, falling asleep, reducing stress, etc. It will also provide more information on prepackaged teas and why they may not be the best for some people. The second to last workshop I will be teaching this fall will be on Friday, November 13th, called Seaside Foraging. The purpose of this workshop is to open up a whole new perspective on foraging for food. It will provide advice on sustainable foraging, information on what is edible and how to identify it, and how to follow local rules and regulations pertinent to foraging near the beach. The final workshop for fall will be on Friday, November 20th, also at 12 p.m. This will be called Fire Ecology and Natural Succession. The purpose of this workshop is to discuss something near and dear to our hearts, how the natural world recovers after a wildfire. We will talk about the fires themselves, the effects on the ecosystem, and the process of succession that follows. So this last bit of the 30-minute FFF presentation I am going to short an recording of one of the workshops I taught, specifically the invasive species one, uh, just to round out the 30 minutes so that you can kind of get an idea of what's going to be happening in fall. Um, so today's workshop, we're going to focus on identifying some invasive species that can be found locally in Santa Barbara area. All of these species are just local to Santa Barbara. Many of them you can find throughout California and even the rest of the United States and North America. Um, uh, and I'll have like distribution maps on there for you. Um, but we also want to kind of focus on giving you a good idea of what you can do about them um, if you see them or how to prevent spreading them. Please feel free to type any questions, comments, or concerns into the chat if you have them. Um, I'll also invite questions via mic, uh, so then you're welcome to turn your mic on at that point as well. All right, please share in the chat what you think defines an invasive species. Just quick couple words, maybe a sentence. Yeah, so someone mentioned not native. And yes, that is part of it, but not all non-native species are invasive. So keep that in mind as you're walking through life. Um, just because you see a plant that's from a different country, it doesn't mean that it's defined as invasive. Definition I have here for you today an invasive species is a non-indigenous species that spreads from the point of introduction and becomes abundant. This invasive species label attaches only to populations of species whose impact upon introduction has altered their new environment, typically with negative consequences. 
common characteristics of an invasive species are it grows and reproduces very rapidly, it spreads aggressively, and it competes with, with native species for resources. So really, your common houseplant or something is not going to be a native species, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be super harmful. Like, it's not going to grow or reproduce, most likely, honestly. Uh, it's not going to spread aggressively and it's not going to compete for resources, um, but there are many species that do a lot of damage and would be considered invasive. Okay, so some fun or not so fun facts, depending on who's listening, about invasive species are they're a huge drain on the U.S. economy, but also world economies. Um, in the U.S., they cost about $120 billion per year to control, um, and you know, by control, I could put that in quotes because really we're not controlling them, we're just mitigating <laughs> the symptoms. They're also the second leading cause of habitat loss in the United States, the first being human development. They also reduce biodiversity, they affect food webs, and they contribu contribute to 42% of threatened and endangered species. Um, so big issues. Okay, how do invasive species spread? You can see I got some pictures on here, like burrs stat attacked, attached to socks or to dog ears. Um, but they can also spread uh, naturally by air, water, and other species. Um, and they can spread in other ways by humans, like when they cling to bike tires, boot treads, boat holes. Uh, when you're transporting firewood from one place to another, can stick to that. Uh, pets can transfer them, and they can also stick to camping gear. What can you do to prevent the spread of invasive species? Um, there's actually a lot of things. Uh, when you, if you ever take a boat out, please clean, drain, and dry your boat to prevent aquatic invasive species from spreading. Um, it's pretty hard to see them, um, so you need to be very careful with fishing equipment as well. Um, also, if you decide that you want a fire where you're camping or wherever you're going to recreate, um, it's best for you to bring local firewood or certified firewood or use firewood that you find right where you're at because often people are accidentally bringing in beetles and other kinds of invasive species that are pretty gnarly to local ecosystems. Um, clean all your clothing and equipment before entering caves to prevent the spread of white nose syndrome in bats. Use Clorox to decontaminate equipment. Don't ruin your gear. I'm sure there's other ways that Clorox might not be the best option for some gear. If you have stock animals, horses, cows, etc., only use certified weed-free hay. Clean hiking materials like boots and tires. Clean your pet's fur and paws in between toes, especially when they've interacted in water. Um, you can also volunteer at a local nature center or volunteer to help uh, pull out invasive weeds or capture invasive animals. Um, spread the word to others like, hey, this is what you should do if you see an invasive species. You can get involved in recording and reporting invasive species if you see them on things like iNaturalist or even just go to your nearby like ranger or something and be like, hey, I saw this and maybe you should check that out. And finally, you could become an invasivore, which I'm a plant nerd, so of course I'd bring this up. Um, basically, for those of you who like to forage and eat wild growing plants, um, you can join this movement out there of people that either only eat or eat in large part plants and animals, I guess, that are invasive um, to help do their small part in reducing populations of these invasive species. Um, if you check out this website I've been working on for the last four years, the IB Ethnobotany Project website, um, we've got a lot of edible plants on there. Um, and there's a couple uh, notable invasive species we've got on there, like chickweed and ice plant, and we hope to get a couple other ones on there as well. Uh, but yeah, so any questions so far, you're, feel free to put them in the chat or say them out loud. Kirsten, are you suggesting that ice plant is edible? Yes, Latin name for ice plant actually means edible. And some people call them sea figs, in fact, because the, the fruit that they produce under the flower, that part is edible. In Santa Barbara area, the fruits rarely develop or they don't develop very well. 
but there are certain climates in which they do develop very well and they're apparently pretty tasty if not a little bit salty leaves. the succulent leaves also are technically edible i've tried one and it was actually the most disgusting thing i've ever eaten uh, <laughs> so i wouldn't necessarily recommend eating ice plant at least in our local area especially since yeah, they're usually where dogs can pee or people spray pesticides so there's a difference between edible and palatable yes so it's not not palatable <laughs> but technically you can eat it what does palatable mean <laughs> um palatable is like tastiness level so so he means that it's good it's edible but it's not good it it's doesn't not taste. good exactly all right i don't know if y'all know how to annotate but at the top of your screen, if you're on a computer, you should be able to click a little pull down menu or something next to the part that says Kirsten is sharing her screen um, and then click annotate at the bottom of that. So I would like you to add to the screen here any invasive species you know about, either locally or globally or anything. They can be animals, plants, insects, diseases, whatever. If you've heard of an invasive species, I'd love for you to add it to screen here Go. all right cool these are all really good ones thanks y'all yeah so just a note on weeds weeds are i hate to say it they're a social construct so anything can be considered a weed as long as you don't want it in your garden um so not necessarily all weeds are invasive although some definitely are some weeds can just be native growing um, wild plants that somebody's like, well, I didn't plant that, I don't want it. Um, so be careful when you throw the term, a term like weeds around. Um, so we got zebra mussels, that's a great one. Radish, at least in our area, is native, I believe. The wild radish, sorry. Broom, that's like a horribly invasive one around here. I, I'll touch on it later. Um, iguanas, I think in some areas are invasive. I don't know much about them. The trumpet flower, there's a lot of plants that fall under like trumpet flower category so if you're thinking morning glory definitely invasive or um lionfish i've heard pretty gnarly things about lionfish <laughs> eucalyptus tree not all eucalyptus trees are invasive but some like the blue gum definitely are pretty bad i didn't add any um invasive mammals to my presentation today just because they kind of are mostly rodents and i didn't really want to focus on rodents today but of course, because I'm a plant nerd, I'm going to share a bunch of plants because I love plants. And I've got a couple other common um, invasive species that you'll see commonly around here. So, okay, ice plant, like we talked about, this one's from South Africa, and it was actually introduced intentionally as an erosion stabilizer on the coast of California. It still kind of participates in that, but it also chokes out any other species. Um, and it looks like it's kind of taken over a bunch of other areas that maybe have cliffs and erosion problems, if you can see this global distribution map. Um, chickweed, another delicious edible that we have around here, um, is from the Eurasian area. I couldn't figure out how exactly it was introduced, but my guess it was either accidentally as animal feed, like in hay or something that they brought over, or brought over intentionally by humans because it's such a good wild edible to eat. You can put it in your garden, actually. Black mustard, you'll see that everywhere, kind of just popping up um, in a open fields and stuff, or intentionally planted in vineyards. I think it helps uh, condition the soil for vineyards that stay there all year, every year for hundreds of years and that are just sucking out all the good nutrients from the soil. I think the black mustard actually helps in those cases. And there's a fun story about how, I'm, I think it's accurate, I don't know, I've heard it from multiple sources, that the Spanish monks who came to like help the colonization process of the coast of California, um, they would plant it along the El Camino Real um, as a way to like pave the way for themselves so they never get lost. And then it just obviously it spread out from there and just took over. Somebody mentioned broom earlier as well. 
That is an invasive plant that we are unlucky to have. Um, it's pretty much unkillable from what I can tell. Like you can tear it from the roots and it, if you leave one root left, it'll still keep going. If you cut it down, but it's already started producing flowers, apparently the flowers can keep growing, get pollinated and create seeds and then drop seeds and then seed even if you cut it down, it just like if you leave it. So you need to like clear out every single sign of broom if you're trying to get rid of this plant. It's pretty, my mom loves it, <laughs> but I just, it's gnarly. And once it gets started, it takes over. I mean, you can see it's taken over Chile, it looks like, and um, all of the West of Europe <laughs> and all of the United States. Uh, so a couple invasive birds that I just shared two here um, because you'll see them everywhere pretty much. The dove, well, the Eurasian dove is non-native, but I think it's, it's the one that specifically has the collar. We do have a couple native ones, but like this bird specifically like knocks those ones out of their niches because it just kind of takes over their food and it's not attacked by predators and just like a bunch of other things like that. Um, and I learned that this species actually was introduced in the 70s when a pet shop owner accidentally re released a couple of its birds and then just decided to release the rest of its flock. And they just took over. Like in one, this these birds were like released in one city and then they just spread in the United States. The starling, you'll see again, pretty much everywhere. Uh, or 100 of these birds were released in Central Park in the 1800s by a group of Shakespeare fans who wanted every single bird that Shakespeare mentions in any of his writings to exist in Central Park. And they just took over. <laughs> they apparently pushed out native nesting birds, spread invasive seeds, and do damage to crops. So they probably cost us a lot of money every year. And I've also got a couple reptiles and amphibians for you. I just chose the most recognizable ones. Um, for example, the red-eared slider is a turtle that you'll see at the little pond in Stork Tower Courtyard, if you're a UCSB student or staff, these dudes destroy aquatic ecosystems by like taking over the food chain. Um, and they're often bought as pets when they're like little babies that are, you know, smaller than your palm. And then they get to like big, huge sizes and people are like, oh my gosh, what do I do with this? Like, I don't want this in my house anymore. And they'll just kind of drop it in a pond thinking, oh, be free. Not good, don't do that. <laughs> The American bullfrog is also pretty gnarly. Um, it's from the United States. It's mostly from east of the Rockies. And I think people released it maybe in a failed attempt to control invasive species, but then they just took over all the aquatic ecosystems as well. And they kind of boot out all the native frogs and bullfrogs and just harm everything. It's not, not ideal. I also decided to throw in a couple invasive insects just to show you that they, that invasive species aren't just big. So like the ash borer, um, that has destroyed forests all over the United States and it makes it, you know, they kill the trees and then they're more susceptible to burning because the trees are all dead, it's a lot of dry wood, or you, you wipe out an entire species, I believe, all of the New York ashes are gone. There is not a single one left. And mosquitoes, so there are native mosquitoes and there are invasive mosquitoes, but mosquitoes are also vectors for diseases that are invasive, like yellow fever. At this point, does anyone have any questions? I'm pretty much done. Um, you can ask me anything, anything at all. I don't have a question, but because you said the ash borer, um, is invasive in, I guess, the East Coast. There's also, I don't know if they're also on the West Coast, but there's a shot sure. hole board. Yeah. Um, yeah. In like, so where I live, which is um, like Southern California, LA Valley area, um, a lot of the oak trees get eaten by the shot hole board. Thank you. Yeah, I think there are a couple there's like bark beetles and pines around here. And, I mean, there's a bunch of different species. I only like put a couple that I've heard of and that I think other people have heard of. I was just up in Utah and we saw whole forests that were just 
no live trees or only very young live trees. And I looked it up and apparently the ash borer had gotten there and just decimated. Oh, sorry, there's a couple questions. Um, what do you think of genetically modified mosquitoes? Interesting. Um, are these the ones that they're genetically modifying so that they can't produce offspring? Yes. Um, I think that every single attempt that humans have made to, not every single, but like 99% of attempts humans have made to introduce an invasive species to reduce other invasive species has been a horrible idea. Um, and I think that humans trying to reduce mosquito populations has the potential for massive disaster because although mosquitoes harm humans in some ways, they're also part of food webs. And if you take out an entire massive species, then you're reducing food for birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals. You're, I mean, you're just, you've just decimated an entire like section of a food web. I, I don't think it's a good idea, but time will tell, I guess. Um, and I'm, I'm not an expert, so I, but that's a, that's a personal opinion. <laughs> that's all I've got for y'all. I really want to thank Ren for helping me out, setting this up uh, remotely. And after this video is done, he will answer any questions that he can for you. Um, and share some links and references that might be interesting for you. But yeah, thank you all so much for coming. I really hope to see you all on Zoom this fall, every Friday. Mm -hmm.